but thank you all very much for coming. My name is Roy Mitchell. I know a fair number of you. I'm. <laughs> linguistic anthropologist by fascination and by training. I've been a student of languages for since uh, junior high uh, and a student of Alaska Native languages since I was 17 and moved to Fairbanks specifically to study Inupiaq, uh, Eskimo language. And I'm very, very pleased in my life that I've been able to continue to work professionally uh, in, in different ways with Alaska Native Languages and people who are teaching and learning Alaska Native Languages and doing what we can to see that they continue to be spoken, living languages uh, into, into the future for future generations to come. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about a really interesting, fascinating uh, topic, the relationship between language and culture and our perception of reality. The idea that language and culture are intertwined is an old one. Um, perhaps most people who speak more than one language, which, by the way, is most humans on Earth, have encountered situations where it seems like, huh, yeah, that's not easy. That concept does not come across readily in this other language I know. So probably most people are aware that language and culture are, are interwoven. There's a more interest, there's an additionally interestingly profound question, however. Do the features of the languages we know shape how it is that we see the world we live in? The physical world and the social world, and perhaps not just physical world here, but the cosmolo cosmology of how the whole universe works. Cutting head to the end. A little bit, yes. We're going to talk about some yes. We'll talk about some maybe. We'll talk about some no. All right, so. OK, there we go. Uh, so looking at how our languages affect the nature of our perception of the world we live in. And I don't know that people can read. Can people in the front row read the little joke? All right, so it's got two. Um, I will imagine them to be Canadian Inuit, although the snowy blue is incorrect. It's a spiral, not concentric stacks. I'm going to let that go for now. <laughs> and one is saying to the other, did you know that suburban white males have over 100 words for lawn? <laughs> This is a reference to an often repeated story that there are many words for snow in Eskimo languages. For right now, I'm going to tell you, number one, there are many words for snow in Eskimo languages. And I'm going to tell you, the number of words is not the interesting part. I don't know if there's 100 words for lawn. There might be. All right, one of, the, uh, one of the scholars that first took uh, serious interest in exploring the relationship between language, thought, and the reality that we live in uh, was German Wilhelm von Humboldt, one of the uh, brothers von Humboldt who circumnavigated the, the globe. A number of things they named or were named after them, uh, the Humboldt Current, for example, Humboldt Penguin, many, many, many things. Anyway, Wilhelm had, of the two brothers, had a particularly strong interest in language, and I'm going to read this to you. Uh, this is interesting in a couple of ways. It's interesting in sort of opening the stage for there being uh, concern and interest in the relationship between language and culture. It's also interesting in his particular case, because for him it tied in with uh, a sense of nationalism. Um, for those of you in the hallway, there are some additional places to stand. Sorry, no more seats, but all of you could stand here. Unless you're comfy there, you can see the slides. If there's one seat, would you raise your hand if you're next to it? 
Okay, thank you. So, Wilhelm von Humboldt. The spiritual traits and the structure of the language of a people are so intimately blended that given either of the two, one should be able to derive the other from it to the fullest extent. Language is the outward manifestation of the spirit of people. Their language is their spirit, and their spirit is their language. It's difficult to imagine any two things more identical. I think he over, may overstress the case. Uh, he was also very much interested in uh, nationalism, and I'm not going to get into the history of Germany. You know, Germany wasn't invented until 1870. Yeah, so this is before that, and people wanting to invent this. So. But nonetheless, an important uh, fellow in that. All right, the first professional uh, person to look at this was Franz Boas. Love that picture of Papa Franz. <laughs> Uh, he made the point uh, in 1911 that race, language, and culture are not the same thing. That was a rather controversial uh, point at the time. Most people in the U.S. thought race, language, and culture come together. You speak the language you do because of who your great-grandparents were. You like these kinds of food because that's what your ancestors have been eating in the past and so on. Um, he also pointed out in looking at these that there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between any certain type of language either whether it's the language, languages are related to each other or certain structural features, and any other aspects of a people's culture. Um, but at the same time, there are a number of ways that a particular language reflects aspects of that culture. So you have two different people with very similar cultures who speak completely unrelated languages. And likewise, you can have people who speak related languages, and yet their cultures are, are drastically different. So there's a relationship, but it's not one to one. So his work, uh, and he pointed it out, and another linguist pointed it out, uh, helped focus this attention on how does our language require us to pay attention to certain things. Edward Sapir, uh, a student of Boaz's, one of the most important linguists of the 20th century, he argued that language and culture are not intrinsically associated in our, our previous discussion here, but quote, language and our thought grooves are inextricably interwoven and are in a sense one and the same. Thought grooves. This guy was so hip. He didn't even know. <laughs> but yeah, the idea is that the way we, our language works is going to in fact be making a little bit deeper grooves in our minds and affecting the way we tend to think. One of his students was Benjamin Lee Orff. Uh, his day job was as an insurance investigator. And one of the things that got him interested in this was um, when he took courses from Sapir and uh, wrote some essays and so on. Uh, he ended up investigating warehouse fires, and a huge number were started by workmen, this is back in the 30s, workmen smoking cigarettes in the safe part of the warehouse where the empty gasoline drums were. They weren't smoking them by the full gasoline drums, that would be dangerous, but these drums are empty. And that's the beginning of him realizing the way we talk about things affects the way we think about things, and these guys figure, well, they're empty gasoline drums. But of course, what is it that empty gasoline drums are full of? Gasoline fuel. So Worf said, quote, we dissect nature along lines laid down by our native languages, organize it into concepts and ascribe significances, as we do, largely because we're parties to an agreement to organize it in this way, an agreement that holds throughout our speech community and is codified in the patterns of our language. Not all observers in the world are led by the same physical evidence to the same picture of the universe unless their linguistic backgrounds are similar. Neither Sapir nor Worf used the term Sapir-Worf hypothesis. It's developed later, after Sapir was gone. It was very popular in the 50s and 60s, and then really, by the late 60s, started to decline. The reason why it started to decline wasn't so much lack of evidence from logic, but if you take the Sapir-Worf hypothesis to the extreme position, the idea that our language, in some sense, determines how we perceive reality, then we can't do empirical observations and hypothesis testing. 
So it's a theory that, if it were true, would mean we can't do scientific theories now. Mind explodes. <laughs> Fortunately, people have nonetheless, nonetheless found ways of empirically demonstrating that some of these things do, in fact, work. I'm going to make a short <coughs> note at this point. Um, people talk about the strong version and the weak version of the severe warf hypothesis. Uh, this strong one is sometimes called linguistic determinism. And I think that all along has been a straw man. I don't think Sapir, nor Worf, nor Boaz, nor von Humboldt, nor Roman Jakobson, who I had talked about, uh, ever suggested that our language forces us into a particular line of thoughts. Rather, and, and Boaz and Jakobson were really good about pointing this out, rather, our language, every language, requires people to pay attention to certain things that in other languages you can just ignore. So it's not that it prevents you from thinking certain things, but it forces you at times to consider things. And that can make a difference in how you interact with the world around you. So, um, yeah, an interesting question. Can any word be translated from one language to another? Now, Boas had made the point, he's certainly right, that you can explain or express a concept in any language. You might have to invent a new word or come up with a definition. But in fact, it's not necessarily, it, it often is not the case that words mean exactly the same thing in two different languages. Sometimes a word in one language will mean, you know, hands for this one, will, mean, will have a matchup with something, a, a meaning of, of another word in the other language, but each word in its own language still has other meanings that don't match. Okay, so there's not a one-to-one -one match between words. By the way, for you people who are monolingual, Oh, I'm so sorry for you. <laughs> but you know, monolingualism is curable. You don't have to die. You don't have to die that way. If you weren't monolingual, you would go, well, of course words don't match up one for one. They about never do. They about never do. Um, yeah. So I'm going to look at some examples here. Uh, this is a fun one. If, if I'm trying to be a little bit hyperbolic, I will say, you know, in Japanese, there is not one word for rice. There isn't a word for rice in Japanese, nor in Korean, nor in Chinese, nor in Vietnamese, nor in Thai. Because what we think of as rice is many, many different concepts, and we just throw them all in the same box together. So in Japanese, the plant growing in the field is ine. That's the plant that grows rice. And in English, we call that plant rice. <laughs> you harvest the rice. You put it in burlap bags. You stack it on the shelves at New Sagaya. In English, we call that rice. In Japanese, it's kome. And then you cook a delicious meal in your automatic rice cooker or on the stove, however you do it. And you serve that to your family, steaming in a bowl. In Japanese, and I don't know the difference in usage here, but gohan or meshi, and in English we call that rice. If you didn't know better, you would think that English speakers cannot tell the difference between a field and dinner. <laughs> yeah, so, does Japanese have four words for rice, or does it have zero words that equal rice? <laughs> they're, 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 they're both reasonable ways of looking at it. So, um, likewise, in Eskimo languages, and here I'm lumping in together uh, the Inuit languages, uh, which run from uh, the Bering Straits in western Alaska, across northern uh, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, and the Yupik languages, which run from uh, St. Lawrence Island, then to the northwestern, northeast corner of Siberia, uh, to Elam, and down, down the uh, southwest coast of Alaska, and including the Sukbek or Lutik language. That's another branch of this Eskimo language branch. Uh, of, of the larger Inuit Monongan language family. That, that isn't on the test. Darn it, I should have put that on there. <laughs> Alright, so in the same sense that Japanese does not have a word for rice, there is not a word for snow in Eskimo languages. Because just as a Japanese person would never encounter generic riceness, <laughs> there's no generic snow. Uh, there's no generic seal. Yeah, I went hunting and I caught, and I'm kind of still, I got no idea. 
Uh, no, they're specific species, often uh, age, sex, sometimes deliciousness. These are characterization, <laughs> characteristics of particular kinds of things. Uh, Japanese not having a single word for, for rice. Um, and so with snow, and, and Franz Boas wrote this uh, over a century ago, and this is the one that got exaggerated. He pointed out three different words for snow. And it's not how many they were, it was that they're different things, and not a one of them equals what is snow in English. So, in English, what do we call when we go outside and these ice crystals are, are falling from the clouds on us? What do we call that? Snow. Snow. All right. If we catch one of them, here, catching it on my cell phone here. If we catch one of them, what is that right there? Snowflake. Yeah, snow or snowflake, yes. Um, if it hasn't snowed for a week, but the ground is covered with white stuff and we're walking on top of it, what is that white stuff? Snow. And if it's been cold enough and there's not this coming down, but we've got 80 knot winds going this way and we have ice crystals that have been beaten and torn and going this way and cutting our skin if we don't have our foot pulled up. What's that called in English? Snow. snow. I'm beginning to see that these are not the same thing if snow actually matters to you. And in fact, you never get generic snow. I don't know if it's coming down to the sky or if it's been sitting on the ground for a month. Well, open your eyes, look, because it's not the same thing. So let me turn this around here. Uh, here's an instance of a, uh, a Yupik word, and, uh, sa, or in other dialects, sla, or chisa, uh, and it's cognate with silla, or sila in Yupik. Uh, this means many different things. It's a, it's a wonderful word, where it's powerfully important, and there is, there's nothing even close to translating it, simply because it has so many meanings. It can refer to the weather. It can refer to the outdoors. It can refer to the sky. It can refer to conscious awareness. And the being or person of Sa is in traditional Yupik cosmology the most powerful being in the universe. You can't translate that in English with a word. So that's the beginning. That's the beginning. Certainly the words are going to line up. One of the big areas of research for, at this point, approximately two centuries in the relationship of language and thought is looking in at our perceptions of color. So it turns out uh, that we think of, thank you Michael Faraday, that we think of color as a feature of light. Okay, also thank you Isaac. Uh, but thank Michael uh, Faraday for uh, identifying that this is electromagnetic radiation and we're perceiving different frequencies of it. And our perceptions of these aren't made in our eyes. And they're not just made in our brains, but they're made in our brains mediated by how those colors are triggered by our language. So there's a concept called basic color terms, and I'm going to define that here in a minute. That we know of, <coughs> languages can vary from as few as two to as many as 12 basic color terms. This doesn't mean how many color terms there are in a language. That actually is open to people can come up with new color terms and do come up with new color terms all the time. The trick is, What's the smallest number of color words that you can fit everything into? Right? So, you know, for example, you could say, uh, that's maroon versus that's, uh, uh, I don't know if moth would be close enough. Burgundy. burgundy, thank you, maroon or burgundy. But nonetheless, they can all be put in the label called red. So maroon and burgundy aren't basic color terms. This concept came from research by a couple of linguistic anthropologists at Berkeley in the 60s, uh, Paul Berlin and Rick Kay. They did a basic color survey project 
I was uh, not involved in their project, but they did loan me a set of their, their color tiles. It's 360 chips with uh, white to black and across the spectrum. And I got to use these with three elders in Quinnahawk in uh, uh, 1991. Uh, so I have a little bit of information that goes with this. So they defined a basic color term uh, this way. It has to not be a subset of any other term. So burgundy is not a basic color term. It's a subset of red. Red is a basic color term. You can't put it into something else. Uh, it has to be fundamentally a name for a color, not for something else. Like I have my late father's turquoise bracelet here. What color are the stones? I was looking for turquoise. I'll accept green. Interestingly, I'll accept blue. In some languages, that wouldn't be an issue. But is turquoise fundamentally a color or a rock? It's a rock. How about the color salmon? Is salmon fundamentally a color? Or a fish. There is a tricky one in English. What is an orange, fundamentally? <laughs> that one depends on whether you're looking historically, because the fruit came first, and the color. Um, anyway, there's a number of things they did, and I'm not going to highlight it today. Uh, some languages have as few as two basic color terms. They have one color term that means everything dark, and another means everything light, and they fit everything into them. That's very rare. We've only got, I believe, two languages that we know of that can do that. There's a lot of languages that have three. Dark, light, and red. Dark, light, and red. And everything can fit into that. I'm not going to do it here to the stage. It's the wrong spot. Uh, often with my students, I'll do something like this, and I'll point to an item and say, is that dark, light, or red? And people never even thought that you could classify all colors into three can do it the first time. So some languages set you up to do that easily. Um, English has 11 now. Um, used to have, I can't remember the number, like five or six about a thousand years ago. It has a whole lot to do with history, it has to do with politics, it has to do with color symbolism. If purple is a color of royalty, then purple kind of steps <coughs> step right up. Right? If purple doesn't have any particular superpowers, then it's probably going to be a shade of red or dark in other languages. All right. Now, I kind of challenged you. In fact, I should have challenged one of the slides that was on here before. It said that the human eye can distinguish 7 to 10 million colors. I think that's what it said. Was that what the slide said? The human eye cannot do. The human eye can distinguish three. Three specific wavelengths. All the rest is done with smoke and mirrors in your occipital lobe. Your eyes cannot see red. We do not even have a red detector. Red is an optical illusion. It's a useful one. It's a profound What exactly? <laughs> now, I, I, I've tried to steal the very best images from the internet. And this one I kind of like, and the other one I kind of like, so I'm going to give them to you both. Um, what this is portraying, ignore for right now this dotted line. Look at what color is that? Pardon? What color are you pointing at? I can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> my occipital lobe tells me it's red. <laughs> And my circle lobe is right 95% of the time, except when it's full. You've done those optical motions with colors, right? You look at something, then you close your eyes, and you see, um, yeah, yeah. It's because your eyes don't see color. Your occipital lobe sees the color. But it's not just your occipital lobe. It's your occipital lobe as influenced by language processing in your head. So it's the color is neither in the outside world nor in your eyes. It's in a complex holographic algorithm. Anyway, so we have on the left here, um, with the peak at some kind of purplish, correct answer to puck quiz, uh, indigo to purplish thing here at uh, 419 nanometers wavelength. And then we have another one at this, uh, it's not even a good colored thing. It's like a, a green way, way off towards yellow at 531. And then a really nice yellow at 559. 
unless you're colorblind, or unless you're one of the very, 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 very rare human uh, females who is a tetrachromat, having four different kinds of colors, it's a new thing. Your grandkids will be telling you about it. Um, unless you're one of those, these are the three colors that your eyes see. They report the relative brightness at three frequencies to the occipital lobe, opposite end of the brain, and your brain creates a plausible guess. Hmm. Yeah. The dotted line is uh, the, the it shows you which frequencies the rods in your eyes see best. And this isn't a big, this is not primarily how your eyes work, but the rods only show you how show you brightness. Your rods don't work when it's bright. This is why. Have you noticed when it's dark outside, uh, or when you're in a dark environment, you mostly, you pretty much only see black and white. Have you notice that? That's because your rods don't tell your brain. Hey, make some colors. Your cones say, hey, we're doing colors now. Take these three data signals, and it's not, it's not bits. It's not, it's not uh, ones and zeros. It's amplitude, but it's amplitude at only three frequencies, and your brain is up the rest. Here's a different presentation of that. Um, I kind of like this one better. So we've got here, uh, we have one kind of cone in our eyes that detects uh, purple, one that detects green, and one that detects yellowish. This one's kind of ugly looking uh, shade there. And it constructs all the rest of those. So it's not the case that we can see the color spectrum. We imagine we can see the color spectrum, but no humans have ever seen the color spectrum. We've all experienced an internal perception of what our mind thinks it surely must look like. Oh, my empirical basis is getting a little quivery here. All right, so here's an interesting one. You know, for us speaking English, blue and green are clearly two different colors. There's some ambiguous cases, right? I'm not talking about ambiguous cases. Despite ambiguous cases, there's still a clear difference between blue and green for us, but not for other languages. Other languages do it differently. For one thing, where blue is a, is a color for us, and we have like some really good shades of blue, and you go, eh, that one's kind of off. And really good shades of green, and other things, eh, that's kind of off. For probably more than half the world's languages, there's a really good basic color term that's close to turquoise or teal. That's one of the basic ones. And what we call green is an off teal. And what we call blue, if it's light, is off teal. And if it's dark blue, then it's dark. So most languages don't do green versus blue. They do it differently. There's a lot of other fun ones. So here's a fun little chart I stole here. So Japanese color terms, by the way, they are in flux. They've been in flux during the 20th century, which is why any of you have been to Japan and driven and noticed their stop lines. You notice the green is different from here? Yeah, that's because there's a semantic shift going on on what ao means in Japanese. It means different from what it meant in Japanese 100 years ago. So they are trying to make it more blue-ish. Now, it's as far blue as they can legally get away with under international law. But anyway, so in English we have a couple different shades of, boy, the color contra, huh? Well, it looks good on mine. <laughs> Up here this looks, doesn't look good. So we've got a couple shades on the left of what could be green in English, and on the right, uh, the third one from the left is supposed, on, on my screen is a dark blue. That looks purple from here. It's a purple from there. Yeah. I'll blame that thing. And, and your occipital oak. <laughs> and then the light one. And the cool thing I'm going to point out here is different languages group things differently. So we're going to come back to the Russian one again. Hopefully it'll look a little better. Where we have one basic color term, blue. They have two different ones. Sine and Galuboy. They're not two different shades of blue in Russian. They're two basic terms. One is not a variety of the other. So I'm going to look very briefly at a uh, uh, Bantu language in Namibia, southwestern Africa. And they slice and dice their colors a little bit differently. This, this again, is more purple than it should be. But these two colors are Guru, that's Dambu, and that's Zuzu. They're not landing in the categories that we expect. 
This, however, has some interesting correlations for them in terms of language perception. Because for them, the fact that they have a different word for Buru and Zuzu means that there's some colors that to us look like very similar shades of green that to them don't even look similar at all. So I'm going to let you guys peek at this. I think I'm, I'm going to see how fast I can go forward and back. Yeah, that was good and fast. I'm going to let you guys look at this one a little longer. So here on the right, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you tell instantly, in a quarter of a second, which one of those is a slightly lighter shade? I'll have to give you partial credit for that one. What's that? Yeah, if you can read the numbers, you can you can figure it out. But uh, yeah, so far it's. <laughs> This one here, the one that's obviously a completely different shade of color, right? It's because it's, we're, we're crossing the line in Himba, but, whoops, but between Buru and, uh, and Dambu. So for them, when they show this experiment, they show it to them, and within a second or less, they go, this one because the structure of the color system in their heads is a different system. Therefore, when the, their occipital lobe invents what they're going to see, it invents it differently. Because remember, we only see three shades. And those aren't even really shades. They're just data. How bright is this frequency? How bright is that frequency? How bright is the other frequency? Now I'm going to show you something uh, illustrating uh, Sini on the left and Galuboy in Russian. Uh, sorry this is a little fuzzy, but again, you know, when you steal pictures off the internet, what can you do? Anyway, so these are different shades of Sini, which is one of the basic 12 colors in Russian. These are different shades of Galuboy, which is another one of the uh, basic color terms. So now what I'm going to do is show you a little test. And on this next slide, I want you to look on the bottom. It's going to be a triangle. Look. Wow, that was fast. Well, now you have a memory. We have, some, we, we have a square. We have a square at the top. And that's what we're comparing to. And we should look at the bottom left and the bottom right. Which bottom, is it left or right, is the same as the one at the top? Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm still seeing my, my thing here. Close your eyes if you're uh, prone to getting dizzy. <laughs> We've seen it twice now. But which is the one that's the same? Is it the bottom left or the bottom right? Yeah. Yeah. So Russians can do that in just a fraction of a second. It takes speakers of other languages a little bit longer to see that that these two are the same color and this is different. Because for us, these are different shades of blue. And in Russian, these are not, these are two completely different colors. This is Simi and this is Kalubu. By the way, empirical demonstration that features of our language affect our perception. And we still get to use the scientific method. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so some other uh, concerns or other, other issues to look at. We need to pick it up here. Is in what ways does grammar affect perception? It's been fun stuff. Those of you who have studied other European languages know that most European languages, there's a, a grammatical gender for nouns. There's masculine and feminine, or masculine, and feminine, and neuter. And so these inanimate objects all are assigned gender. Fun experiments they've done for uh, speakers of these languages, interviewing them. Um, 
and, and people's sort of stereotypes of how you describe a certain object end up being masculine stereotypes in that language if it is, uh, like for example, Der Tisch in German compared to La Mesa in Spanish. So when Spanish speakers, even bilinguals, Spanish German speakers, when they're speaking in Spanish, in Spanish we ask them to describe the table, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very elegant and refined, and when describing Der Tisch, it's very strong and fortress -like. All right, the interesting one for me is looking at kinship terms. Now you think kinship categories ought to be a natural thing, right? There should be like mother and father and sister, brother, and you, you'll learn the different words for them, right? I can't tell you how many people, how many times I've had people say something like, oh, well, what's the word for auntie in Yupik? Or they said, what's, what's the word for uncle in Dunaitina? And for beginners, I gotta say, okay, this is at least two cups of coffee. Yes, it is. <laughs> I gotta explain to you why your question doesn't actually refer to anything in the world. I gotta start over from there. Because kinship categories are culturally created, as in some sense are color categories. I'm not gonna go through this in much detail. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely slide I put together. This is referencing kinship terms in Dena'ina, which is the local Athabascan or Dania language of the Cook Inlet area here. Um, and for those of you that are familiar with kinship diagrams, we have uh, the person we're starting with uh, as I or ego, and that's she in uh, Dena'ina. And what I'm gonna point out to you is just one of these. So up here, uh, the guy's mother is, uh, if he were referring to her, he would call her Shunda. And you would not be wrong exactly to translate that as my mother. Please note, however, that Shunda is also his mother's sister. Shunda. Mother, interestingly, also is his father's brother's wife. Now, in English, in our parents' generation, we have four kinship categories. Right? You got your mother, you got your father, what are the other two? Aunts and uncles, right? Not every kinship system has four. A lot of kinship systems have six. Right there. You know, your mother, your father, your mother's uh, sister, your mother's brother, your father's sister, your father. Your brother. That's really common that they're six. This all has four just like English, but they're not the same four. If we're going more into kinship, I'd spend more time at it, but I'll just give you the answer. Shunda is my female relative, one generation older than me, of my own clan. Shtupda, which includes father, my male relative, one generation above me, of the opposite clan. Of me, clan from the opposite side. So, male or female, same clan or opposite. Those are the important. Those are the important things to know and live as a Dunaidina for the last I don't know how many thousands of years. Not what was important in England 1,500 years ago of knowing how are you supposed to treat this person, this one of your relatives versus that one of your relatives. So we learn how to categorize and think about our relatives, and it's so powerfully ingrained in us that I think most of us do think that it's natural. Of course, there has to be a, a word that means exactly mother. No. Okay. Um, all right, and uh, here, here's some other kinds of grammatical, grammatical things. I don't know, Marcia, if you can see this one at all from where you are. Could you step forward for just a second? I'm not going to call, call, call on you, except try to tell the truth here and get her to still come up here. Marsha Hodge from Tlaquan, Clankett Elder, Language Revitalizationist. <laughs> so one of, one of the things, one of your test questions was in the non-Ada languages, the death best one, the Dania ones, plus Yet, plus Clankett, uh, for some actions, like picking something up or handing something, 
you, you have to use a whole different verb depending on the nature of the thing, and it's its shape or its form. So for example, uh, to tell somebody, pick up that box, or pick up that chair, and uh, pick up that paper, so the pick it up is, is katan, gasati, or kati. There's about a dozen, roughly, of these. Um, and I was going to ask uh, if you told someone, pick up the baby, you would say? Ah, gasna. Ah, this is an empty box, ah. but it has something in it. And it's not that we can't think about these differences. Like, for example, if I said, pick up that sack of potatoes to you in English, versus pick up the baby to you in English. I reckon you probably do it a little bit differently. You probably wouldn't just do this, but we wouldn't be whoops, wouldn't be able to tell from the language in Thinka and in Eak and in the 50 or so Athabascan or Dene languages. You can't even talk about it. You can't tell someone to pick it up unless you use the verb that specifies the nature of the thing that you're. Picking. You can't even generate um, And one of the final ones, how are we doing on time? We need to... We're good. We're good? We're good. Um, one of the most exciting ones for me, and this is one that has empirical uh, demonstration on it. Um, oh, I should have checked before we got in here. Okay, so I think this is my, is this my west behind me? Yeah. Sure. That's okay. I've got people pointing three different directions. Okay, and we're in Barrel Room East. Yes, are we in Barrel Room East? Okay, thank you. Got confirmation. It's officially East, anyway. Yeah. All right. I would like you to raise your north hand. Almost half of you have done it. I'm not even half to come and say, no, your other north. Yes, your other north, please. Yeah, okay. In Google Yumi Thayer, which is an Australian Aboriginal language, in Seltal Maya, which is an American Indian language of the Yucatan in southern Mexico, and in Tamil, which is a Dravidian language of Ceylon off the coast of India. There, there, there is no right and left. I mean, you can specify this line, hand, like for example, Google, you meet there, you say, my strong hand and my weak hand. I suppose if you were weak hand dominant, I don't know how that works. I don't know. I don't know. But everything is not related to right and left. And in English, well, it's more complicated than this. We have three different ways to reference things, location, and to orient ourselves in space with them. But for things that are nearby, we mostly use right and left and in front and behind of ourselves for the person we're talking to. In these languages, these guys use absolute terminology. That is, they reference the world around them. This can be handy, right? Because if you say, I want you to go left, which way is the left? I don't know. He's, he's moved. The left isn't even there anymore. <laughs> That was my interpretive dance for <laughs> And people who speak these languages grow up using things like, oh, watch out, there's some fire ants to the southwest of you with little kids. So that by the time Google Yumi Theater speakers are two years old, they know their north, south, east, west, plus the quarters in between, age of two. 
average for English speakers in the U.S. to be consistent with right and left? Average, mind you. Some of them are there. Age 11. I didn't include it, but this is a wonderful empirical disproof of a mindable comment. Yeah. Yeah, he, he felt we experience and encounter the world and our place in it starting from our own bodies working out. Um, we start from the world outside and come in. And now we know. Interesting correlations. Speakers of these languages, I'll start off with some of the fun things. They use gestures differently. Like if, if I wanted to talk about um, over there, I'm going to have to switch mics, right? Speakers with these languages have no problems pointing through themselves <laughs> over there because those cardinal, cardinal directions exist anyway. These things show up in people's dreams. They show up in their uh, storytelling. There's a Google Yumi Theater elder who was recorded on a motion picture movie uh, describing a shark attack, his canoe in the ocean had tipped over, and a shark came up, and I can't remember the direction. Um, but let's, let, let's say the shark came up uh, from the northeast. And he's telling the story about how the shark came up from the northeast and bit him. Happens to be the same elder was being videotaped 30 years later telling the same story and he was talking about how the shark came up, how the shark came up from the northeast and bit him. Now we would never do that in English. We would be referencing the shark based on our own body as if our body were a world landmark that never moved. <laughs> But for him, what exists is the north, south, east, west. And here's the most amazing one. They've done this with Google Yumi Theater speakers in Australia, at Cell Phone Mayas in Yucatan, taken them, with their permission, to faraway big cities with skyscrapers, checked into a hotel, given them a tour, museums, up and down subways and everything. And then at the end of the day, in the middle of a building, without windows, say, would you point to our hotel? 100% of them within 15 degrees in a strange city they've never been to. They've done the same experiment with English and Dutch speakers. Do you know the term random? <laughs> now we have no reason to believe that uh, the Uyumi Theory of South Palmaia speakers are, have some genetically based super ability to have like a pop-up visor that's always giving them north, south, east, west. But it works like that. And the difference is their language. Their language requires them 24-7 to be conscious of the four cardinal points. Other, Alaska, other systems, including, as far as I know, all Alaska Native language orientation systems, have a likewise have an absolute orientation system, but it's not based on north, south, east, west. It's based on the terrain. So we've got upslope versus downslope, upriver versus downriver, down towards the river, up from the river, out towards the coast, or up inland from the coast, or up to sea and back, and in some languages, up the coast versus down the coast. And those things exist regardless of which way the person is turning, because it's not about the person's body as a way to measure everything on the planet. But for me, for relative locations of things that are on the planet. So these other kinds of things cause us to experience literally our place in the world differently. And I'm going to uh, wrap up, I hope, quickly these last two, because I'm going over time. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about evidentiality, which is a feature of some languages where they they give you the epistemological basis for what you are saying. Epistemology, branch of philosophy, which is studying the question of how is it we know what it is that we think we know. So in the Inuit non-language family, uh, there's three different bases that get coded for evidentiality. One of them is things based on empirical observations. I have seen this or heard this. Myself, I have seen this thing, I know this thing. The second is to surmise or figure something out. And the third is hearsay. I have been told that this is true. So in Inupiaq, Silaluktok, uh, it's raining. I really shouldn't be saying that unless, well, I I've got a window here. Let's imagine I didn't have a window here. And imagine I had been inside for three hours, which I have, almost two hours. Um, I would be in a position to say that myself because I, in fact, don't know. The 
If I saw somebody come in and I saw water dripping off their clothes, I may say, uh, it seems that it's raining, or I surmise that it's raining, because there's indirect evidence that could well be explained by that, but it could also have been explained by a bad beer, uh, beer stein accident walking past the server. So I still don't know. I don't know myself from empirical observation that it's raining. And then there's uh, reportedly it's raining. I ask, hey, is it raining outside? And they go, oh, yeah, it's coming down. Yeah, then I can say it. I still can't say because I don't have that empirical basis for reporting that. Um, I don't have any cool studies that show how this works differently in speakers. Uh, there's other languages in the world that have much more complex evidentiality systems where you have to put in relative time when you learn something was true versus when the event happened. You know, I just learned that at the end of the Jurassic versus, eh, Shani, back in the Jurassic, we all knew this. <laughs> much more complex uh, languages in Java. And I'll leave you with one last one here. These are what I call grammatical questions disguised as philosophical questions. Um, I, I've developed a bad habit lately, and I read a thing called Quora. Oh, sucks me in. Somebody's like, I don't have time to follow. I'll check it later. They're all wrong. You gotta straighten them out. I'm a little upset with both of them. But someone wrote it. And half the time, the questions, they're just trying to get an answer. Like, oh, my favorite worst one. Well, I'm a vegan, and what can I do to make my cat live as a vegan, too? <laughs> Give your cat away to someone else. Get a journal. Can't have a vegan cat. Anyway, here's one of the questions. How is it possible? And this, and this may well be it. I think this is a real question. How is it possible the universe was created as a result of no cause? Actually, you can stop there. But anyway, they go on and say, I've read that the cause and consequence is a feature of this universe, and not prior to the Big Bang, but still all that chemistry, laws of physics, etc., out of nowhere. So how is it possible the universe was created as a result of nothing? This looks as if it were a philosophical, or a cosmological, or a theological question. It is not. It's a grammatical question. Some verbs are transitive. They require a subject and an object. Other verbs are intransitive. They do not require a separate subject and object. The choice of the verb create in English requires there be an independent agent and an object or patient that it's acting upon. Congratulations, you have just analyzed the grammar of the English word create. You have not even begun to ask anything at all about the universe. But you might think you have. You might think you have. Language has that I'm sorry I've gone over time, but I've had a great time. Do we have time for some questions? Or do we need to move on? I'd say about five minutes for questions. Five minutes for questions. Okay. Let's start with the hard ones. Who's got a hard question? Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the different types are actually implying about these objects? <laughs> I, 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 can, I can tell what the characteristics are. Okay. And I'm not sure if that's going to get into the implications or not. But So uh, there's one for a, a, a generic, not too big thing. Mm -hmm. There's something for a collection of things. Okay. Um, and the different not in a languages have some of the same categories, and some of them vary. But they all have between about 8 and 12 categories. Uh, there's one specifically for a long stick-like object. Uh, one of my favorites is for a floppy object, <laughs> like a, a fish or a piece of paper. Um, container, yeah, th this was a really cool one in, in, in Thinkit, container with contents versus container without contents. And I, I sometimes, on purpose, uh, when I'm talking about this in classes, I'll have like a soda pop bottle with the lid on, with, con with contents, take the lid off and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand this to you. Do you care whether the lid's on or not? <laughs> or if I said to someone,
of money. There's a cup. Here's a coffee cup. Why don't you close your eyes and pick it up? Don't you kind of wish you knew whether there was hot coffee in there or not? But English does not require us to code those things at all. So, to my way of thinking, it in fact is telling you something about the nature of the act of picking up or the nature of the act of handing. It also goes with another sort of set of verbs that just means there is or it exists. Um, but that would also be a great thing for people to explore further. Yes? When you were talking about the Australian Aboriginals in the absolute sense of direction, mm -hmm. do you know if that only occurs if it's their uh, native language? Did, did you like acquire that skill through language acquisition? That is an exciting question. Yeah. I don't know that anyone has done that. Um, if it would, I imagine there'd be military applications. The question was, it's a great question. So for Google Yumi there, or Tselkal Maya, or Tamil, do those, does that dead reckoning skill that 100% of the people have if they learn that as a first language, can you acquire some of that dead reckoning skill by, I'll, I'll modify your question, the question slightly. Could you acquire that by becoming a fluent speaker of this language? Or, or contrarily, and I don't know the answer, the contrary part would be, well, you could become fluent, uh, but most people in this room are old enough to know who Henry Kissinger is. Very fluent, very eloquent speaker of German, but who spoke with such a dick accent, you needed a knife and fork. <laughs> Sorry, that's slipping into Morrison and Natasha. Um, so I, I have no idea whether you would actually acquire these skills. You'd probably get a little more accustomed to paying attention, more, more than I was before I walked up here. I should have figured it out. So you might get a little bit of that. My personal guess is you probably wouldn't have the automatic 24-7. Somebody could wake you up in the middle of the night and say, which direction is that? And you'd know before you could even open your mouth. That's just a guess, a great question. Yes? I would mean, just add a comment on that question. It's like, I think you have to learn that outside. There's so much of our culture is inside. And so much perception is based upon who you're related to economically rather than what we're actually related to the environment. So that's like a process here. You want to learn that. You have to do that by that. Yeah, well, it's not just outside. You know, the classic, you know, Google you meet there, culture would have been mostly outside because they had very, very simple shelters. But Tselkal Maya, people have been living in box-shaped houses for at least two or 3,000 years, and they still use them. So there's the north, south, east, and west wall, or if you're on the slant, the northwest and southwest. Yeah, and in fact, one of the things they wrote down, uh, one of the couples they were taking, uh, Tselkal couples staying in the hotel, and, and uh, the wife was asking her husband, um, it, 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 it's the hot, what do you call these things? Faucet, thank you. Is the hot faucet on the southwest or the northeast side, honey? So, yeah, it's it's not necessary. It's, it's like everything is that way, including parts of your body. Yes?
almost did those kind of subtle kind of things too. Yeah. Um, all right, I, I I'm going to have to go because I got to be somewhere else. I'm hosting a bit on the other side of town.